number 10, Blinded by Ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So. Surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel is Corset poke off, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen. Get out of here. At number eight, no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carried that pain with them as much as Catherine de' Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt, and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress, and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband, though, Catherine Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just you know marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. 
At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her away. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chilonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chalones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. 
How about the tea on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now luckily he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful, but back in the day makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you. Or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup. Like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chimay. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion, so how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealth wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh Hapshepput because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth though recently in 2015 when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdou El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight, Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum, a little piece of Egypt 
Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, it's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust, scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered. A totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in German's hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with a little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the Queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After after radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasure, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number five, original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close, let's just Give me a shovel, I'll get in there, I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three, brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut, so there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as Pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two, her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. 
Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming Pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Number 10, overshadowed and the beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half-brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III, but she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number nine, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh? The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1,500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation, it was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah, yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this, while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen, so take this one with a grain of salt, but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen, so there. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens, like the one I mentioned before, concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if you got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like, 
20 and in her prime, so she looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack naked and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass, honestly. Just do your thing, work it girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go girl, you got this. You get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't, we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's, that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number 5. Honey Coated Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well you know the phrase you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief. Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number three, till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well, if you were servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered a very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. 
that's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about. Yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title of heretic king and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel el Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. And number 10. Witch trials. We've talked about witch trials before in reference to the Dark Ages, but now let's talk about when witch trials really picked up in the Renaissance. Before the Renaissance, the idea of witchcraft was a thing, but it wasn't really seen as that much of a threat. Back then, it was believed to be pagan superstition and the devil trying to plague humanity, but with the reformation of the Catholic Church, it was argued that witchcraft had increased and that harsher penalties were needed, especially for women, because why the the heck not. Witch hunts and trials started to pick up more and more, especially in southern Germany and the British Isles. Thousands of men, women, and children were tried and executed for witchcraft, though many historians believe that most people confessing to being a witch was because of the mental exhaustion that came from their torture. But speaking of torture, we have to talk about how people got the truth out of those accused. There were many devices used to torture potential witches like the Breast Ripper. Pretty self explanatory there. Hot stools and sharp metal devices. What sucks is that when witch trials picked up in the Renaissance, they didn't really die down until around the 1750s, so being accused of practicing the dark arts was a basic part of society for far too long. Number nine, printing. We can't talk about the Renaissance without talking about the Gutenberg Press. I'm sorry, we just can't. Is it unusual? Not particularly, but is it true? Yes. In 1450, Johannes Gutenberg introduced the first mechanical printing press to Germany and changed the world forever. With his invention, the spread of information and ideas allowed for the Renaissance to blossom. Books were cheaper to own because they didn't have to be handwritten out or like stamped one by one. One of the first things he printed was the Gutenberg Bible, also known as the 42 line Bible. When the Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople, prompting Greek creators and thinkers to move westward, the printing press aided in making their ideas spread across Europe. With the printing of the Bible and easier access to broader thoughts, this threatened certain power structures that banked on the ignorance of their followers. In 1501, Pope Alexander VI promised excommunication for anyone who printed manuscripts without the church's approval. I wonder why. But by that point, it was already far too late. People were obsessed with ideas and it's all thanks to the printing press. Huh. At number eight, Rotten teeth. In these modern times, looks mean a lot. Lots of people get work done to look quote unquote perfect, but back in the Renaissance, their idea of looking good was very different. Today, a lot of people want that perfect smile. To achieve the perfect straight white teeth that so many people desire, people get braces, use whitening products, and even get veneers to look good, but in the old days, having that perfect smile would be a sign that you had no money. That's right, in the Renaissance, the way of showing how much money you had was by showing how rotten your teeth were. 
This all became a thing because of sugar. When it was introduced to Europeans in the Renaissance, the wealthy bought it all up and they used it in a wide variety of things, but this also caused health problems like rotting teeth. But because they were rich and held a lot of power in society, having gross teeth became a trend and so to follow it, people started making their own teeth look rotten by painting them black so they looked like they had been dining on sugar even if they had never seen it before. Now in retrospect, it might sound bizarre, but what I'm most fixated on is how bad everyone's breath would smell with everyone walking around with rotten teeth. Ew. Number seven, the Reformation. The Renaissance was all about resurgence and coming out of the dark, quite literally after the Dark Ages. A rebirth. The Reformation was a period of religious, political, and cultural upheaval that shattered Catholic Europe. Some of the ideas, structures, and beliefs would lay the foundation for what would build the continent for the modern era. Martin Luther, John Calvin, and even Henry VIII began challenging the papal authority and started questioning the Catholic Church's ability to define practice. Henry divorced from the church to marry Anne Boleyn, as we know, creating a new religion altogether, becoming head of the church. With the invention of the Gutenberg Press, as I mentioned, pages of the Bible were finally able to be placed into the hands of the people to read and form opinions. But this massive series of disruptions erupted in wars and violence, mostly between the Catholics and the Protestants, but it really, really changed the world. At number six, Belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't make it any less poisonous. This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean people haven't tried to use it for their own personal use. Normally, we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the Renaissance, people said full send and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, that's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs, the organs we use to see, because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry-eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could cause some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short-term memory loss, confusion, disorientation, and in some cases, death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad you don't do that anymore, then think again, baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist to get your pupils dilated, well, guess what they use? That's right, belladonna. It's not harmful to put a couple drops in your eyes and to not do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high doses, then you're in for some trouble. Number five. The rise of the Medicis. The Medici legacy stretches all the way back to the 12th century, but come the Renaissance, they really came into the spotlight. The House of Medici first attained wealth and political power in Florence in the 13th century, but in the 1400s, Cosimo de Medici, later known as Cosimo the Elder, started a legacy that would go down in history. They were massive supporters of the arts and humanities, and were one of the main reasons Florence became the cradle of the Renaissance. This immense Immensely powerful family produced not one, but four popes, Leo X, Clement VII, Pius IV, and Leo XI. Their family dynasty lasted over three centuries. The last Medici royal failed to produce a male heir, and that's why it ended. Leo X was one pope who brought back something called indulgences, essentially a pay to play ticket to heaven. He also basically bankrupted the Vatican with his endless spending, so it was a lot of drama there, a lot of scandal. Ew. Number four, plague cures. When the plague or the Black Death swept through Europe in the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, people didn't really know what to do to cure people of the sickness. I mean, they didn't have the same medical advancements that we do today, so they came up with some pretty creative theories on how to cure the Black Death. Were they effective? I don't know, ask the millions of people who died of the plague. Some of the quote unquote cures for the Black Death included snuggling up to a live chicken because it was believed that the chicken would draw pestilence out of your body. It was also suggested that those infected with the plague drink a glass of their own pee twice a day. Or you could pluck the chicken that you were just spooning and put his bare, freshly plucked chicken butt on the plague spots to heal them. Clearly these things didn't actually work since around 25 million people died of the plague and it absolutely decimated Florence, one of the elite cities of the Renaissance. Number three, the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Not only unusual, but incredibly terrifying. Hands down, not a good time to be alive. 
The period lasted for over 200 years. Basically, it was a purge of non-believers by the Vatican, especially those in the Jewish community. Tomás de Torquemada was one such man during the event who played the role as Grand Inquisitor. If you weren't Catholic, you were given two choices. One, convert. Or two, be burned at the stake for heresy. Or tormented slash tortured. There really was no in between. He, along with many others, used cruel measures of torment such as hanging, burning, suffocating, the rack, and even waterboarding to extract confessions. Nobody knows precisely how many died in total, but it's presumed to be over 30,000 people, with Tomas executing and tormenting over 2,000 that he oversaw. At number two, prayer timer. Back in the Renaissance, technology wasn't really doing it to him. So things like clocks weren't something that everyone had. Clocks were around, but they were quite expensive and they were rarely accurate, so they were essentially pointless. So how did they tell time? Well, some would use the sun to indicate the time, but again, it was more of a generalization, not very accurate. And others would use the chimes of church bells. But for small things, like timing something for five, 10 minutes, people in the Renaissance use a very different method and that was prayer. In a book of beauty and household tips, it was advised that you time things based on prayers. So for example, a recipe might call for you to recite two Our Father prayers as a basis of how long you should let something sit. Again, it might not have been very accurate because people speak at different speeds, but when you don't have a clock or a stove timer, you have to get pretty creative for telling time. And last but not least, we have St. Bartholomew's Massacre. As we now now know from some of the other points on this list, there was a lot of religious tension between in the Renaissance. The event took place on August 23rd to 24th in 1572. King Charles the Ninth of France, persuaded by his mother Catherine de Medici, remember the Medicis, ordered the assassination of Huguenot Protestant leaders in Paris. What came as a result was an absolute bloodbath. Mobs of French Catholics took the lives of Protestants, but it's all Catherine's doing, had previously tried to remove Admiral Gaspard de Coligny, whom she believed was leading her son into war with Spain, which she was not into. But he was only wounded, and Charles was dedicated to finding out who was behind it. So instead, to cover her tracks, his mother used it to convince him the Protestants were responsible. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders, just like that. Listen to mom. She implicated Coligny, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. Thus the fray began. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was over 70,000 people. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games, and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number nine, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey, you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not gonna know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, 
Why are you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now, I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really, I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass, and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhou was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like a zoo, you couldn't find a more romantic place. Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC. His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually, his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage, and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave for what he wanted. Obviously, this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word, philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here, 
was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it. Yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him. He would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kind of just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your Well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too, check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. We have At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time, while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day. And if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery, just standing there just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrinstein Castle. At number 10, fashion. 
Back in the Dark Ages, fashion and high quality clothing were a symbol of status in society. For the elite, it was their way of displaying their wealth and high status over the poorer population. Because this meant so much to them, obviously they had to go above and beyond with their looks and oh boy oh boy, did they take things to a whole new level. Everything was super exaggerated. For women, they just wore the finest dresses, but for men, that's where things got spicy. Male fashion was quite something. They would often wear dangerously short tunics with tights and belts to really snatch their waist, followed by the codpiece to really accentuate things down under, you know? But their shoes. Don't even get me started on their shoes. They wore some seriously pointy shoes, and to them, the longer and pointier, the better. Their elf looking kicks were really what screamed, I'm better than you, to the rest of the public. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone to keep their shape. These people looked pretty ridiculous, at least to our modern standards, but back then, wearing pointy shoes and tunics with the codpiece was like the equivalent to wearing a full Gucci fit. And number nine, helmeted chickens. In the Dark Ages, peasants didn't really get the best food. The good stuff was more so saved for the members of the elite, and these people ate some good stuff. I mean, to us it's weird, but to them, it was finger licking good. Speaking of finger licking good though, let me tell you about one of their weirdest foods, helmeted chicken. No, it wasn't a special chicken that was prepared with special ingredients or whatever. It was literally what the name is, a helmeted chicken, aka a chicken with a helmet on. I know, weird, right? This was a theatrical dish to say the least. It featured a regular old cooked chicken that was stitched to a pig like he was riding on its back, and to add a special little something something, the cooks would fashion a tiny helmet to make it look like a guard or knight for whatever lord or king that they were serving this bizarre dish to. This was a fan favorite because of how extravagant it was, but that trend sort of lived and died in the dark ages because you can't catch any chef doing something like that these days. Gordon Ramsay would have a fit over this one. Before I carry on telling you guys about all the weird and crazy things that people did back in the dark ages, I would first like to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also consider subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number eight, beautiful death. Death was kind of a big deal in the dark ages. Sounds weird, but you also have to take into account the fact that the average life expectancy was only about 30 years old, so really, you didn't have long. Also, people back then were faced with some pretty harsh times like famine, cold, and of course, the Black Death. Because they had to face death so early on and so often, the so-called art of dying came to be. The whole premise behind the art of dying revolved around dying a good Christian death. According to those who lived in the Dark Ages, your death had to be planned and peaceful. When someone was on their deathbed, they would concern themselves with accepting their fate without quote, despair, disbelief, impatience, pride, or avarice. End quote. This art of dying thing was very popular amongst priests, and this actually led to a lot of painters at the time depicting people in holy professions as submissive to death and what was to come for them. At number seven, Feast of Fools. One of the more lively aspects of the Dark Ages was the many festivals and holidays that were celebrated. Though most of the population worked grueling hours for days on end, they often got breaks to hold celebrations. Most holidays and celebrations that were held were religious, but others were just silly and were designed for people to have fun, like the Feast of Fools for example. The Feast of Fools was held in early January and was inspired by the pagan festival of Saturnalia. This was a pretty interesting festival because it involved swapping the highest respected officials with serving maids and they became masters and were crowned kings of misrule. This festival first started as something confined to the church, but soon it became a bigger affair with parades, comic performances, music, costumes, and even drag. These people really liked their festivals. Another pretty weird festival that they held was the Festival of the Ass, where a young girl carrying a child would ride on the back of a donkey into a church, and during the service, instead of saying amen, they would say hee haw like a donkey. I know, bizarre, right? At number six, soccer. These days, people regard soccer or football as a modern European sport, and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around a lot longer than you might think. Soccer was first played back in the Dark Ages, however, it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then, the sport didn't even really have a name, and there were no rules either. The only thing that people followed when playing the game was the objective of winning. Back then, you were allowed to win by any means necessary besides deliberately offing people, of course. 
Back then, soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody, and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players, so it was really a free for all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314, King Edward II banned the game, decreeing, quote, on pain of imprisonment, such games to be used in the cities in future. End quote. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would be really intense if it hadn't. At number five, weddings. Marriage and weddings back in the Dark Ages were very different than they are today. Back then, because the average life expectancy was so low, people started getting married and having kids very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, around the age of 12, and these marriages were not for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or for alliances. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriages just weren't as big of a deal back then as they are today, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. Most people didn't need permission to get married, so they could hold the ceremony anywhere. Marriage ceremonies were held in places like pubs, in the middle of the street, or even in bed. Because of this, it made it really hard to know who was really married and to whom until the 12th century when it was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. To make things even weirder, the consummation of marriage was also pretty odd because it wasn't a private affair. The act of bedding wasn't seen as an intimate moment between the couple, but rather an investment in the union, so it was observed by witnesses. I am certainly glad things have changed. At number 4, Jesters. You would think that being a court jester in the Dark Ages would have been a pretty bleak job, but you would actually be wrong. I mean, yeah, they looked funny with their outfits and hats modeled after the ears of a donkey, but jesters actually held a lot of power in court, making their job a pretty good one compared to other common folk. The court jester's job was to make people laugh by doing tricks, stunts, and telling jokes. Sometimes a jester would poke fun at the king or lord that they served, or would make comments about a kingdom's politics, and for a lot of people, saying these types of things would give them a one-way ticket to the gallows, but not the jester. Because of their profession, by royal decree, anything that they said was taken as a jest or a joke, so no one could get mad or offended at what the jester said or comments on. Basically, the jester was the one person in the court who was immune from medieval cancel culture. They could offend anyone they wanted to, and no one could stop them. At number 3, Unicorns and Jesus. The thing about the Dark Ages is that it was full of superstition and mythology. Within this period of time, there was a lot of confusion when it came to religion as paganism and the rise of Christianity were both hot topics. Many times, superstitions and mythology from paganism made its way into the religious beliefs of Christians and things were known to get a little weird. Take for example the unicorn and how it was incorporated into the Christian beliefs of the Dark Ages. It is believed that a mistranslation of what is thought to have been an ox is what brought unicorns Unicorns into Christianity. Because of this mistranslation, the Bible likened Jesus to a unicorn. Since it was in religious texts, people in the Dark Ages sort of just ran with it, and so they started incorporating the unicorn into many religious artworks. To further this whole unicorn thing, they made up a superstition that only innocent maidens were allowed to touch unicorns, and they even used the unicorn to come up with a rather uncomfortable allegory of Christ entering Mary's womb. This unicorn thing was also fueled by the Vikings at one point, as during the medieval age, Vikings were known to con people into buying narwhal tusks marketed as real unicorn horns. At number 2, Divorce by Combat. Back in the Dark Ages, if you wanted a divorce, you had to be willing to fight for it. Literally. In medieval Germany, couples would take to the ring to settle their disputes, and it was quite the showdown. Trial by combat was the common way of settling arguments back then, but when a husband and wife were fighting, things were a little more interesting than just having an all out brawl. During these divorce by combat proceedings, the husband had to stand in a hole with his hands behind his back, while the wife ran around in a circle with a bag full of rocks. I don't really see how this settled anything, but who am I to question the methods of the Dark Ages? And finally, at number one, Animal Court. I think that one of the weirdest things about life in the Middle Ages was their legal cases. As I just told you, their divorce proceedings were literally a trial by combat. They also found bizarre ways of trying someone if they were accused of witchcraft as well, and that was pretty dark, but the strangest court battles involved animals. Yes, 
Animals were sometimes put on trial back in the Dark Ages. All animals from livestock to pets and even insects were not safe from the law and they would be put on trial if they were suspected of breaking the law. According to records from the Dark Ages, at least 85 animals were put on trial for a number of reasons. Pigs were the ones who were put on trial most often for chewing off people's body parts and even eating children. In 1474, a rooster was put on trial and found guilty of the unnatural crime of laying an egg, and even unwanted rats were put on trial and received strongly worded letters demanding that they leave the premises. The most bizarre case though involved a donkey who went through a legal trial and actually won. This donkey became the victim of unwanted advances, but was deemed innocent because someone declared her to be quote, virtuous and well behaved animal, end quote. These people had way too much time on their hands. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Murdochs. With the high profile of this ongoing case, coupled with the fact that Netflix just released a chilling documentary about the story of this family, it is likely that you may already have quite the idea of who the Murdoch family is. Taylor and I have been watching the documentary series, we're past the first few episodes, and man is this story wild. A few years ago, if someone asked you who the Murdoch family was, you would have likely described them as one of the most powerful families in South Carolina. Carolina, with a legal dynasty that has spanned for a century. Now, if I asked you that same question, the answer would be a family who had it all. Money, power, status, but some of the members flew a little too close to the sun, tragedy ensued, and now people have lost their lives and the family has been destroyed. It started back in 2015 with the death of Stephen Smith. It carries on to 2018 when Gloria Satterfield, a long-serving employee for the family, was found passed away after a quote, trip and fall accident. These events are both horrible and completely atrocious, but despite the rumors, mysteries, and alleged conspirators of these deaths, things really started to unravel for the family in February of 2019 with the death of Mallory Beach. The young woman met her untimely fate after a boating accident where, allegedly, 19 year old Paul Murdoch was at the wheel, intoxicated. We could spend hours and hours talking about this family and all of these cases and the conspiracies, but we are short for time, which brings me right to the most recent tragedy. The 2021 killings of that same Murdoch who was driving the boat, as well as the killing of his mother, Margaret. Now, I do believe that people are innocent until proven guilty, but it is important to note that the one on trial for these killings right now is the father and husband to the deceased, Alex Murdoch, the patriarch of the family who is supposed to be carrying on that Murdoch legacy. The stories surrounding this family are horrific, tragic, and a reminder of the dangers that money and power can bring. In our number nine spot today, we have the Sacklers. This family is the one behind the dynasty of Purdue Pharma, who is best known for producing an exceptionally strong prescription painkiller. Of course, we all know just how big and rich a pharmaceutical company could get, especially one that has been around for quite some time. The company was first created in 1952 by three Brooklyn-born brothers, and in the beginning, the company mostly dealt in things like laxatives and earwax removal methods. Soon, things for the company took quite an upwards turn, and before anyone knew it, the family was regarded as one of the most esteemed New York families, but they were also known for their philanthropic tendencies, with their names on museums and hospitals, some of the most famous in the world. You see, the thing is, when they released this painkiller in 1995, it led to them amassing an insane $13 billion fortune. That is obviously incredible, but the trouble came when it was realized that this painkiller wasn't nearly as potent as it was marketed to be, and frequent users would be building up a tolerance to it, meaning they needed to use higher and higher dosages. Viewer, welcome to the opioid crisis. Crisis. Basically, this all spiraled out of control and led to many, many lawsuits coming against Purdue Pharma. Not only by individuals, but by January 2019, 36 states were suing the company for what the painkiller had done to their citizens. After two years of deliberations, the Sacklers finally reached a deal with plaintiffs in bankruptcy court in September of 2021. As part of their Chapter 11 proposal, they agreed to pay $4.5 billion and give up all ownership of the company in exchange for complete immunity in all future opioid liability. Despite this fall from grace, the Sacklers were able to move an alleged $1.36 billion into offshore accounts, so despite their bankruptcy filing and the large sum of money handed over, they will continue to retain quite a large amount of their personal wealth. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Bakers. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were once the most famous televangelists in America, and they certainly were living in quite a lap of luxury. They had beautiful homes, expensive cars, and a ton of money, but that quickly came crashing down 
down amid horrendous scandal. In the late 1980s, after much success, Jim Baker resigned from the PTL ministry after there was a cover up to hide some hush money that had been given to church secretary Jessica Hahn over an alleged SA situation. Of course, not necessarily a surprise, but definitely not a good look for a televangelist. This led to more interest in people looking into the family more, and soon it was uncovered that there was some sort of accounting fraud going on as well. The consequences for this came by way of felony charges, conviction, imprisonment, and divorce. That was the end of that legacy, but since serving his time, Jim Baker hasn't exactly slowed down. He not only remarried and returned to televangelism, but he also currently hosts The Jim Baker Show, which focuses on the end times and the second coming of Christ while promoting emergency survival products. So. That's interesting. In our number 7 spot today we have Prince Sado. Born in 1735, Prince Sado was the heir to the Korean throne, but unfortunately, he would go on to suffer from extreme mental illness and delusions. Thankfully for historians and those of us interested in history, the wife of the prince created memoirs and in them she detailed the horrifying things that happened next. The prince began to kill. He began to hurt and torment people. He basically turned their home into a house of horrors. The prince also endured some pretty horrific treatment from his own father, which of course is not an excuse for the things he did, but it definitely did not help the scenario. Eventually, the family had enough and realized that his behavior would go on to ruin the name of their family forever, so something needed to be done. At the time, tradition stated that if the prince were to be executed, his wife and child would also need to be, but everyone thought that maybe that was a bit too far. Why should they have to pay for his crimes? This led to the king coming up with quite the bizarre workaround for this. On a hot day in July, the king forced the prince to step into a rice chest, which was then locked behind him. This acted as a way to make it seem like he had caused his own death, which is said to have occurred just a few days later. In our number 6 spot today, we have Don Carlos. This little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kinds of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias, in the mid 1500s, as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors, though, are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things, like hurting or taking the lives of animals for fun. Nowadays, we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then, it was like, I don't know. Was anybody even watching you, really? It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Soon, of course, his cruelties would extend to humans, with people claiming that one time he chose to harm a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. Major King Joffrey vibes in that one. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made that the prince didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after after a few hours with the man, she decided that there was absolutely no way in hell. Like, he was so bad that she would rather marry his dad. Which she did, in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement where he passed away six months later. In our number 5 spot today, we have Prince John. It is said that this may be one of the darkest secrets of the British royal family. Prince John would have been the uncle of Queen Elizabeth II, but he passed before she was born. Prince John was the sixth child of King George V and Queen Mary, and it is said that he suffered from seizures, likely as a result of epilepsy, although it's hard to diagnose for certain because of all of the secrecies surrounding him and his illness. From the age of four, when he had his first seizure until his untimely and very early death, Prince John lived in a separate estate where he was cared for by a governess. Many people have since criticized the royal family, calling their treatment of Prince John as callous or inhumane, like they were hiding him away for being ill. Of course, the palace was concerned with the monarchy's public image, and there was a belief at the time that royals shouldn't have any physical or mental ailments, although that is of course impossible. They also didn't include him in public events, which could have been another image thing, and also perhaps because of a worry that he might have a seizure at one of these events. At the end of the day, it was definitely a different time, but the idea of excluding him because he was ill truly is a really sad thought. In our number 4 spot today, we have Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy. This is a royal scandal that took place all the way back in 1314, and it starts off with the daughters-in-law of King Philip IV of France. I think that's the fourth. 
earth, here's hoping. These young women, Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy, were accused of having quite a scandalous affair with two brothers, Philippe and Gautier. So this already is some hot tea, but apparently when Queen Isabella of England, who is the daughter of King Philip of France, so I guess like sisters in law with these ladies, when she heard these stories, apparently she's the one who totally outed their affairs. It was obviously a huge deal and both of the women admitted to their adultery. This led to them being pretty much erased from public knowledge. They had their hair cut short and they were thrown in a dungeon, and even though Marguerite was meant to be the Queen of France through her marriage, when her husband ascended the throne, she stayed locked in the dungeon until the marriage could be annulled. Little is known about what happened to either of them after this point, however it is believed that Marguerite passed away in 1315 and Blanche 1326. As for the men in this affair, well, they met quite a gruesome fate that involved the removal of their bits and pieces before their swift execution. In our number 3 spot today we have the Duggars. Alright, one of the most famous reality TV families, and even before the horrors of this family came to light, they were already a family that had fame due to quite a strange reason. If you're unfamiliar with who the Duggars are, you might be more familiar with the show that they used to have on TLC titled 19 Kids and Counting. Yeah, the show ran on TLC for 7 years until it was cancelled in 2015, and the show featured, well, the Duggar family. The family consisted of parents Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar and their 19 children, 9 daughters and 10 sons, all of whose names begin with the letter J. It was an interesting time, and they seemed like this huge, happy, religious family. But in the years since the cancellation of the show, some horrifying things came to light. Initially, the reason that TLC suspended and then subsequently cancelled the show is because it came to light that the eldest son in the family, Josh, had done some horrible things and acted violently, horrendously, and inexcusably against a number of girls, even some in his own family. Due to the popularity of the show before these serious stories came to light, there was a spin-off show that was created titled Counting On. This show first aired in December 2015 and stayed on the air for a surprising number of years before it was pulled and the family yet again found themselves in the center of a scandal that had to do with Josh. This time he was caught in possession of a certain kind of tape that no one should have and that should not even exist at all. I can't say which kind of tape, but just know it's the worst of the worst. These are, of course, some of the worst scandals that have surrounded the family, but truly, it's only a drop in the bucket of the many stories surrounding them. In our number 2 spot today, we have King Juan Carlos. The former King Juan Carlos of Spain, when he first ascended the throne in 1975, was highly looked upon. He was said to be bringing a new age for the country, an age of democracy. His reign lasted for quite a while, but by the time 2014 rolled around, he was forced to abdicate the throne. This was due to a few reasons. Firstly, his public ratings started to plummet after word spread of him being a bit of a womanizer and after an explosive affair, but also because of a lavish elephant hunting trip he took in the middle of an economic collapse. Okay. Fair enough, I can see why people were getting their guard up a bit. So the king abdicated the throne in favor of his son Philippe, who sits on it to this day. During this time, however, the scandals in the family weren't only to do with Juan Carlos. In January of 2014, another of his children, his daughter Infanta Cristina, was charged with tax fraud. She has since been acquitted, that happened in 2017, but she was stripped of her title as the Duchess of Palma de Mallorca, and this whole deal had her leaving Spain and moving to Switzerland. The drama doesn't end here, however, because her husband actually was convicted in the case with charges that included embezzlement, fraud, and tax evasion, and he received prison time in 2018. In the end, none of the fraud charges have ever been linked back to the former king, but this entire debacle did cause the former ruler to move out of Spain. With his move came a letter, part of which read, quote, Guided by the conviction to perform the best service to the Spanish people, their institutions, and you as king, I am communicating my thoughtful decision to move at this time outside of Spain. A decision I make with sadness, but with great serenity. I have been king of Spain for almost 40 years, and during all of them I have always wanted the best for Spain and for the crown. In our number one spot today we have the Rothschilds. This family is easily one of the most, if not the most, powerful family in the modern era. In fact, it is said that most of us in the western world don't even realize the impact this family has had on our lives, as our consumer driven lifestyle is definitely directly related to the monetary systems this family put in place. This would include the United 
United States Federal Reserve. Because of this insane amount of money and power that this family has held for over a century, there are plenty of conspiracy theories going on surrounding them. The conspiracies run deep, and they go quite dark. They touch on everything from assassination attempts, some successfully completed on sitting presidents, to heinous World War II agendas that would have benefited the family. Of course, they are conspiracies, so no one is quite sure which of these secrets, if any, are true. Even still, the stories and speculations swirl today, waiting for some piece of evidence to maybe bring them to light. Number 10, three fights and a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, they uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave, like right there, front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number nine, no heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season two back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or, you know, smile. That's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena, where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah. stop. Number eight, vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health-boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 was a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities, and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex bombs, ooh ooh, beefy men, 
Yeah. Roman women believed that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Woo! Number five, blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return to these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious. Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, there were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Dominion, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD, their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a Nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, place your bets, people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah. Take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was, gladiators had a code they had to follow, and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because gladiators were expensive investments, and seeing your prize fighter that you've like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents, and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're good to go, right? Cool. However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had one in five or one in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. 
And finally, coming in at number one spot, Naval Battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the, you know, pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged Naval Battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded, which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. Then these ships would come out and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. Can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trap doors to hide animals inside of. What a nice upgrade, what a show. Also, this is terrifying. Number 10, starting off strong with Animal Court. That's right, in the Middle Ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were, of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that, so they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding, number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to-do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament, which must be observed by God, but not only God, the families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night. Very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union. That's right, the tickly boo, the boo boo, the jiggy. That, yeah, that's right, your parents, your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the Middle Ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trafia started dancing in the street and by the end of the week 40 people joined in and by the end of the month 400 people joined in. It was nuts! It was like a massive never-ending rave. Initially, physicians thought folks were just stressed out, so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness, but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point, they were like, oh, we better cut this off, and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray, and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in, and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece, well, I think you 
I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women, on the other hand, had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the Middle Ages. We have literally almost tried everything and I fear what happens next like women's fashion we just we've done a lot of stuff anyways in the Middle Ages a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face why no idea maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead who knows but either way it was a big deal so what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows hairline and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy-turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean, technically they're already wearing kind of dresses, their long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip, or more usually, place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting, though, is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors, and therefore relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got fell sick with a cold. He died that way. It was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding, or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh, wow, what's happening? Their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield, there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number two, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the Black Dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th to 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called
called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title I have to say, football, because football, had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really really violent. You could <laughs> you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football, you could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. Top 10 cursed artifacts that scientists can't explain. Number 10, the screaming skull of Burton Agnes Hall. The screaming skull of what? That sounds like a horror film right off the bat. Let's talk about it. The screaming skull of Burton Agnes Hall is a legend surrounding an English county house in Yorkshire. Yeah, as you could guess, it's terrifying. The story goes that Anne Griffith, one of the daughters of Sir Henry Griffith, who built the hall back in the 17th century, well, she was attacked and mortally, mortally? Well, she was attacked and mortally wounded. Now, before meeting her sad demise, Anne had one request. She asked for her head to be kept inside the house forever. Just the head, just that one head, just that's it. The rest of her doesn't matter. Just the cool, awesome. When it was removed, supernatural disturbances occurred until the skull was eventually returned to its rightful place, I want to say. It's said that if the skull is removed, eerie noises and disturbances plague the hall. So, yeah. Oh, I shouldn't touch the mummy head from the 17th century? Ah, oh, damn it. I always thought I could poke it. Easy. Number nine, Peck Island. A cursed island. How does that even happen? That's almost impressive. Peck Island, located in the Detroit River near Windsor, Ontario, revolves around the story of Hiram Walker. Walker was a Canadian entrepreneur who owned the island in the late 19th century and legend has it that Walker planned to build a grand mansion on the island but it was quickly thrown off its course by a series of misfortunes and tragedies all of which is believed to be a part of this island curse now the mansion was never completed of course and the island is now known for its ghost stories and tales of buried treasure yeah you can't tell me that you can't be like oh the island's cursed and forbidden but also there's treasure there so I don't know may the odds be ever in your favor I guess good luck number eight Bella Lugosi's mirror. Best known for his role as Count Dracula, haunting off the bat, this mirror reportedly belonged to Lugosi and it is said that he gazed into it frequently. Of course he did, it's, it's a mirror, that's the only thing you can do. That's not exactly the crazy part. The crazy part here is after his death, the mirror is believed to have passed through various hands, with each owner experiencing disturbing occurrences, suggesting that the mirror may in fact be haunted. A haunted mirror, you're like, ah, it's me, it's my face. I just roasted myself, I guess. These events have led to a legend that Lugosi's spirit, or something connected to him, is stuck inside the mirror. Do we break it and then release him? Do we not break it? Is that bad luck? What do we even do at this point? I don't know. Do you believe in a haunted mirror? Just cover it up. Problem solved. Put a doily over it. I'm like, eh, I'm good. Number seven, haunted chairs of Belcourt Castle. Haunted chairs, that's awesome. That sounds like the haunted mansion in real life is zipping around your house. That's amazing. The haunted chairs of Belcourt Castle in Newport, Rhode Island. They have a history of paranormal lore, if you want to call it that. <laughs> 
That's the lore right there. A chair moves sometimes. It's a safety hazard, really, at this point. Watch your step. Built in 1894 by Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont, a really long name, the castle is known for its collection of antiques and artifacts, all that smell incredibly great and old and dusty and horrible to breathe in, including several chairs that are said to be super haunted. Everything else is just old and fine, but the chairs, demon in that chair for sure. Visitors and staff have reported feeling a force pushing them out of these chairs, which I know must be frightening when you're sitting there, but when I think of that, it's hilarious. It's now a cartoon. <laughs> Whoa! Baker's haunted wedding dress. Normally wedding dresses are reminders of the best day of your life, right? You look at it, you're like, yes, I was there, we're in love, awesome. At least that's what they're supposed to feel like. When it comes to the Baker's wedding dress, there's nothing but terror. Yeah, all in those laces right there. You zip it up, it's horrible in the back. In 1849, Anna Baker, a rich young gal from rich Pennsylvania family, fell in love with a low class iron worker. And her father did not want her to marry a man from the lower class, because how dare she do that, right? Ugh. Uh, bu -bu -bu. He forbid the wedding, all that stupid old stuff, but unbeknownst to the father, Anna had already bought a dress. She was excited, she was in love, she was committed, all right? It was the 1800s, so there was for sure a no return policy, so Anna remained single until the end of her days. She died in 1914, and rumor has it, she passed away with that very same wedding dress still in her arms. Now after that, the house was turned into a museum, because why, of course, and the dress is now said to move on its own within its display case, supposedly manifesting Anna's restless and unhappy spirit. It's amazing, there's a floaty dress. It's like a Spider-Man villain. That's the scariest one so far. Number five, Robert the Evil Doll. First of all, Robert, it's not a scary doll name, but don't let it fool you, okay? This guy here, just as bad as Annabelle. A man named Rob Otto, he was given a doll that looked a lot like him, all right? This is how the story begins. You know how you get a doll that looks like you? Sure, that happens all the time. One of his servants who didn't like him made this doll for him. Yeah, you already know where I'm going with this one. It was a voodoo doll, right? Of course, why would you accept this? This is obviously a trap. Neighbors would hear Robert talking to this doll. Robert and Robert, the podcast. Tune in, awesome. Now after Robert's death, the new owners of the house found that same doll in the attic, still there. Well, actually their daughter found it. It was a pretty jarring experience. The family was haunted by this doll for years. They would hear threats coming from it. They would talk to them at night. Everything that you don't want to hear, it happened to them. So now the doll's on display in a museum in Key West. Do we believe in this one? I don't know, I'm a bit skeptical. Annabelle, maybe. Robert, not as scary. Try again, pal. Fix your name first. Mandy the Haunted Doll. There we go, we got another doll. This one sounds a little bit more frightening. Apparently the most malicious entities on the planet take the form of a doll. Who knew? Mandy the Doll, remember this name. Mandy lives in the Quesnall Museum in Canada, and the staff at the museum insists that Mandy is kept in a separate display case. Because when Mandy shares a case with other dolls, these other dolls would magically end up being knocked over in the middle of the night. Turns out Mandy loves attention, huh? Staff also reported their lunches disappearing on occasion, but me personally, I think that they're reaching at that point. That's just a greedy coworker who's blaming it on a doll. That's, that's his whole, that's a different thing. That's, that's one guy, you gotta go find him. That's not the doll. Number three, Pompeii artifacts. I love geology and history and all that stuff here on Bumblebee, it's great. But it's hard not to want to bring something home after you visit a famous landmark. But depending where you go, you could get in a lot of trouble for, you know, stealing a rock. Sounds silly, but listen up. Pompeii, for example, once a flourishing Roman city located near the Bay of Naples in Italy that was, of course, until 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius erupted and it buried the entire city and sadly its inhabitants under layers of ash and pumice. Now, the eruption was so powerful that it wiped out all of life within a 16 mile radius. Pompeii, of course, remained buried and forgotten for almost 1700 years until it was rediscovered in 1748. Today, Pompeii is an archeological site that offers a glimpse into ancient Roman life with well-preserved ruins of homes, public buildings, streets, artwork, you name it. It's all there. It's great. And there's a great amount of people who steal from this ancient landmark. Because of course there are. How to get cursed 101. This is how you do it. Tourists would steal fragments of monuments, literally pieces of the city, put it in their pocket and go home. But every year, roughly 100 packages get sent back to the archaeological superintendents and most of them are accompanied with a letter explaining the bad luck that occurred with this piece of rock that they stole. So. Don't take things that don't belong to you. All right, cheers. Number two, the anguished man. I mean, first of all, aside from its dark history, who would be able to look at this and have this hanging up in their home? This is terrifying. Imagine this on your wall. That's from 
from The Conjuring. That's a horrible thing to look at. I would take that down immediately. The Anguished Man is a painting with history. It is said to be haunted by the spirit of the artist who created it, a man who mixed his own blood into the paint as he worked. Yeah, real artsy guy. I love when people do that. Awesome. Don't do that at all. The painting has been passed down through generations of the artist's family, but each owner has reported strange occurrences while in possession of the haunting piece. Some have claimed to hear whispers and moaning coming from the painting late at night, which is uh, it's pretty scary. It's also kind of funny to imagine a painting just being like, mm. you're like, what was that? Is that that's kind of beautiful. Is that an E minor? Would you spend the night with this haunted painting? I would. I don't know. I'm a skeptic. I would just, again, not look at it. I would hang it up and then turn this way. Ah, it's kind of creepy. I don't know if I could do that. Now I get it. No way. Number one, James Dean's car. Buckle in for this last one, folks. James Dean's love for fast cars was, of course, well known. And sadly, because one of them led to his tragic death at the age of 24. He died by doing something he loved, which is, okay, has some silver lining to it. Some are convinced that his cars were cursed the entire time. Dean's first car was involved in an accident that left him with a broken leg. And his second car, the one that he famously died in after colliding head on with another vehicle. I mean, that's already too, too many. That's two accidents. That's two cursed cars. That's tragic history right there. But after Dean's death, that's when the hauntings begin. The Porsche was sold off and quickly became infamous for causing more accidents and more deaths. One of the owners even reported seeing the ghost of James Dean beside them in the passenger seat while they were driving before crashing. I would have crashed too. If I saw any ghost beside me, I'd be like, oh my God, that would be it, no matter what, James Dean or not. The car disappeared from public view in the late 1960s and has since been rumored to be hidden away by collectors who believe it to be cursed. Do you own the car? Is that you out there? Where is this thing hiding? I kind of want to take it for a spin. I don't know, I'm kind of weird like that. Would you drive in this car ever? Me neither. Those are the top 10 cursed artifacts that scientists can't explain. Number 10, cherubims and angels. We're starting here because I don't know where the cute depiction of achingly beautiful angels came from because in the Bible, they're terrifying. Considering that every time anyone saw one, they were terrified. Which leads me to think that it must have been a very terrifying experience because they looked, well, you know. I mean, a glowing orb or person coming down from the heavens would be shocking. But consider this description from Ezekiel 1. Also, out of the midst, therefore, came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, so they had cow feet and they sparkled, and they had the hands of man under their wings on the four sides, and as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. So for some reason, we have confused the little baby angel things on church ceilings for the horrifying four-faced half-animal, half-man creature that would fly around. Apparently, the image we have of Cherubim's Day, the cute chubby face baby ones, were a copycat of the Greek and Roman depiction of Cupid, and we know cherubims are important guardians in the Bible, but when did we learn that they looked just wow? I would freak out if I saw one, personally. Number nine, I am Legion. This next one appears in Mark 5, 1 to 9. This story should be terrifying were it not for the pigs. According to the Bible, Jesus came across a man with an unclean spirit who screamed in the mountains. The man would cut himself and he would not be bound by any chains as he would tear them off him with ease. But when he saw Jesus, he ran to him begging for help. But then he condemned Jesus in a loud voice for which Jesus responded, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered saying, my name is a legion for we are many. Here is where it changes from creepy to confusing. The man, or the demons, begged Jesus not to send them out of the country, but into a herd of swine, pigs, that were near the mountains. So Jesus obliged, and the demons flew from the man into the pigs, and then the now demon pigs ran into the sea and drowned. And there were also 2,000 of them, which means some poor farmer lost his business for that year. Why did the demons want to stay in the country so bad and then drown themselves? Did the host need to die in order for them to be released? Or, or did they turn into dolphins? Like these are the questions we all need answered. Number eight, never tease a bald guy. Kings 2, 23, 24. Teasing is wrong, making fun of people, not cool in general. But should they meet a violent death in return? 
No, probably not. I think we can all agree, reconciliation is better. According to this chapter in the Bible, Elisha was a wise old man who was sadly going bald. He was just walking one day, minding his own business, when a group of kids started to make fun of him. They started doing exactly what mean kids do. They started making fun of his insecurities. Also, Elisha slash Elijah just came back from doing some cool things, and he was like a well-liked guy, but he was obviously upset by such a horrid, unprovoked behavior. So he looked back at them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. What happens next? Two female bears from the forest come over and maul the rascals to death. So violent. Wh why? Just, just smack them on the hand and teach them a lesson. That's very, very harsh, and I didn't know that happened. So moral of the story, don't tease a bald guy. Number seven, Lilith versus Eve. Okay, so apparently the only time Lilith is ever alluded to in the Bible is in Isaiah 34 as the screech owl. But beyond that, there is no mention of Lilith before Eve in the creation story, at least in the King James Bible as I found. But she is called Lilith in DBT, the Darby translation. Here's what's confusing. Why does she appear so much in our lore? She actually appears as a she vampire in the legends of the Talmud as Adam's first wife, who was born from earth like him, not from his rib. Then according to the medieval work of the alphabet of Ben Sirach, he recounts her story in more detail. After she was created, they immediately fell out and Lilith left Eden. Divorce. God sent three angels after her to convince her to return, but she denied them. God said that if she didn't return, a hundred of her children would die every day. She agreed to the terms, but then said that up until a boy is eight, she will have power over them, and the same thing until a girl is 20. Unless they had angels written on a talisman, then she would do them no harm. So that's very confusing. I don't know how they arrived at that arrangement. But considering Lilith is only mentioned in the Christian Bible once, how has she become such a prolific character in the creation story? She's depicted in multiple TV shows as a leader in the apocalypse, but so little is really known about her unless you cross things over to other texts. So fascinating and confusing. Number six, the Nephilites, Genesis 6, 1 to 14. Giant angel hybrids. Yeah, you heard me right. In Genesis 6, the Bible mentions that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Also, we used to live forever. What? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. So these are the children of the sons of God. Then later they are described as giants when Numbers 13, the land we explored devours those living in it and all the people we saw there are great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked like the same to them. I'm not sure what's going on here. Were the sons of God men on earth? Or was the Bible referring to angels mating with human women so they could give birth to giant babies? It's just, a, it's just a whole smorgasbord of confusion. Number five, Noah cursed his grandson. So most people know the story of Noah and the ark and how by order of God, he built the ark to save his family and friends, but then just God destroyed the rest with a massive flood. But apparently seeing him naked was like a massive offense. So God said to Noah to go ahead and populate the earth. And God made a covenant with Noah that he would never drown the earth again. As a reward, he gave Noah everything and to celebrate, Noah grew a vineyard and got drunk on the wine. So drunk that he passed out, naked. Noah's son, Ham, then found him, told his brothers and they grabbed a cloth, backed up, so they wouldn't see him and put the cloth over his naked body. But when Noah woke up, he was angry that his son Ham had seen him naked, so he cursed his grandson Canaan. He said, "Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will be his brothers. Canaan was Ham's son who had done nothing wrong, but then he was cursed to be a slave for the rest of his life. It just made no sense. Number four, a talking donkey. Numbers 22, 28 to 30. I learned select stories growing up in the background of my religious education, but somehow this one escaped me. I didn't, didn't know about this one. The story of Balaam's donkey is often overlooked, probably because the reason it's there is a bit confusing. One day, while Balaam was riding his donkey, the angel of the Lord appeared in the road, so the donkey tried to swerve. Balaam beat her back onto the path. Then the angel moved to a corner that provided no alternative route, so the donkey just like laid down. Then, and I quote, 
Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. Escalated very quickly. Also, he didn't even acknowledge that his donkey is now talking to him. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Pretty reasonable conversation, I like his argument. But Balaam didn't seem at all shocked that his donkey was speaking to him. And wasn't even grateful for the fact that the angel was trying to kill Balaam and the donkey actually saved his life. But my question is, did the donkey continue to speak after this? Number three, a questionable marriage offer. Samuel 18, 25, 27. We all know what it's like to be in love. Heck, stories about people climbing mountains and defeating foes for their love are riddled throughout history. But when Saul told David what he had to do in order to marry his daughter, Michelle, he did not expect what the demand was going to be, but he did it anyway, because David is a good guy. Good guy, David. Saul wasn't a huge fan of David, and no one really understood why, besides the fact that God really loved David and Saul was jealous, but in fact, everyone loved David, especially his daughter Michelle. His plan was to ensnare David by making him his son-in-law, and David being a good guy, good guy David, accepted though he had nothing to give. So Saul told his servants to tell David, the king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Whew, that's brutal. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. He never actually planned for him to come back with all of these foreskins. But David, being good guy David, came back, counted the skins in front of him. Now Saul had all these foreskins and uh, Michelle and David got married. What did he do with them after? What do you do with that many of them? Number two, Jesus curses a fig tree. There are a lot of great lessons about humanity in the Bible for sure, but sometimes there are moments like these that, huh, you know, furrow some brows. In Mark 11, when Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king, there is a very peculiar moment where Jesus curses a fig tree. The passage goes as follows. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. We all know what it's like to be hangry, but no one told Jesus that figs aren't always in season? Later, his disciples see the tree withered away and marvel at the sign of his divinity, and Jesus uses it as a teachable moment about prayer and why you shouldn't hold grudges. And last but not least, the random appearance of women slash Adam's ribs. Okay, so when I read the creation story, one thing that really stood out to me, and I remain confused to this day, is that like women just kind of appeared after the story. Anyways, I'll, I'll continue. So God made man from dust off the ground and put him in the Garden of Eden. When it was time for him to have a companion, God put him to sleep and took out one of his ribs and then with this rib he made Eve. Then a whole bunch of stuff happened with the tree of life. God punished them. Adam and Eve went to have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel because he was jealous that God liked his offering more, therefore committing the first murder. And it, and it continues to say in Genesis 4, and I quote, then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him, so he would live forever. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. The entire time, up until this point, no one has said anything about Eve giving birth to a girl. So where the heck did Cain's wife come from? Then his son, Enoch, had a son named Lemek, who all of a sudden had not one, but two wives. Apparently, Adam and Eve did have 20 or some odd daughters, but why in the entirety of the creation story, and I read all of it, they are not mentioned. They just say they had sons and daughters, where were they? No idea.